The most iconic and simplest way to extract gold from the earth was to pan for it. This method was also the cheapest and least effective. Panning involved the use of a shallow metal bowl, if one could be procured from such establishments such as Samuel Brannan's, or if the miner could not find one, then any bowl would suffice. Panning required little to no research or preparation time. You could begin in the morning and potentially have results in minutes. The prospector would crouch beside the water, scoop out a helping of the soil and stone. They would then swirl it around in the pans in the hopes that the heavier gold would sink to the bottom as they gradually worked off the undesirable material at the top of the pan. Winnowing was another early technique where the pay dirt would be dug up and set out to dry on a large piece of canvas. Once dried, the material would be crushed into finer particles and then tossed into the air on the canvas where the wind would blow away the lighter material and ideally, the gold dust would fall back into the canvas. These techniques were among the first used by those searching for riches during the gold rush, and many had good fortunes with them, because the gold was easy to find and at the surface of these rivers and streams. But in order to search deeper into the waters and the hillsides, where there was no natural water to aid in the separation of sediment from gold, the miners would have to develop complex methods and devices in order to extract the precious metal from the earth. It was not long before miners came to the conclusion that use of the pan, and the pan itself, was a most inefficient approach to searching for gold. More soil and sediment needed to be moved, and it needed to be moved faster and in a less laborious manner. The rocker box, or cradle, was soon invented. It got its name as it resembled a child's cradle. The cradle is a device that separates the gold from sand and gravel by rocking the device back and forth. It's made of a high-sided box with an open end and an open top. The top of this box contains a sieve for classifying the material. Usually the openings will be a half inch or a quarter inch, and this lets the smaller pieces of rock and material through while keeping out the unwanted larger chunks. Inside, the bottom of the box is often lined with baffles that separate out the material. This works to catch pieces of gold as they are washed through the classifier box. The final stage of this process reverts back to the panning method. After many shovels full of dirt and rock have been put through the cradle, the miner then takes the heavier material that has been collected in the slats or riffles on the bottom of the box and sorts them by hand. Ideally, it would take four men to efficiently run a cradle. One to dig the material from the ground, one to carry it from the claim to the cradle, one to put the dirt into the cradle itself and pour water over it, and one to rock the cradle and remove unwanted larger stones. The long tom and the sluice were the last methods that could be employed by a small operation of miners. The long tom was much like an expanded rocker, often having a 10 to 20 foot trough, though unlike the rocker box, agitating of the pay dirt was not done by hand, but by gravity and the force of the running water. The length of the sluice was dependent upon how refined the material needed to be. They were often linked together and could be many yards long. Miners would often dam and divert streams great distances in order to direct the constantly moving water that was needed in order for the sluice to work. The water would come in at the highest point of the sluice and gravity would carry it down, pushing and separating the material as it went, first separating out the largest pieces through metal bars called grizzlies and as the material moved downward, the heavier gold would be caught in the riffles and eventually panned by hand. The rocker box and the sluice of the gold rush era were deficient in catching the finest of gold particles called flour. So, miners often put mercury or quicksilver at the base of these contraptions. 
because the chemical composition of mercury would trap fine gold. The miners would heat the mercury, and as it vaporized, it would leave the gold behind. Often, the mercury was trapped and reused. It wasn't long into the gold rush before the placer miner slowly gave way to the larger operation. Many men who set out on an ambitious journey west to stake a claim for themselves and to strike it rich found that they were either too late in finding the easy gold or were just in the wrong place. A journey that was born of independence soon transformed into one of paid labor. These miners found themselves working for larger operations run by the very wealthy or for corporations. These men were no longer working for the same end goal, which was to excavate gold from the earth. Now they were simply working for a day's wage while someone else reaped the rewards of their work under the sun or under the earth. As the easy gold in the rivers and streams started to disappear, miners recognized that their tactics needed to change. With the advent of hydraulic mining, miners could blast away large expanses of sediment and rock. Water would be forced through a hose that grew narrower and narrower until it led to a nozzle called a monitor. At first, the hoses were made of canvas, but soon crinoline replaced it as the material of choice. In such instances, where the miners found themselves up against a particularly stubborn piece of hard rock, they would create a hole in the wall and fill it with black powder. They would then touch off the black powder to blast the hole and continue pummeling the sediment with the hose. The excavated rock was then run through a sluice to acquire any gold that the mountain had released. With the advancements in mining, the environment was being altered at an alarming rate, and the consequences of hydraulic mining would last for years. The sediment that would wash down river into the valley would cause the river banks to rise and flood. Dredging was another technique used once the gold on the surface of a river or stream had been gleaned from the top layer of sediment. These machines would scoop up the sediment, either with a single bucket or a continuous loop of buckets, which then would run the material through various phases of classification, such as in a rocker box. The smaller pieces of rock and sediment were then run through the sluice. All the remaining material would be dumped out the rear of the dredger into piles along the banks, called tailings. It was not unheard of for some of these tailings to grow to be seven stories high. The third large-scale technique for mining gold during the rush was underground hard rock mining. Corporate mining was never more prevalent than it was in this version of gold mining. It took a much larger bankroll of money and many more hands to run this mine. The process involved extracting the gold from the hard rock. In this case, the rock was quartz. The miners would trace the veins and blast the gold and rock at the appropriate locations. The shaft was then mucked out and the ore was brought to the surface for further processing where the gold-bearing quartz would be crushed until it was a sand-like consistency. This would be done with something called a stamp. These stamps were large slabs of steel or cast iron, which would be raised and dropped over and over onto the pieces of ore until they were small enough to be passed over to the amalgamation process. It was a large undertaking to build a stamp mill, so most were owned and operated only by larger mining companies. Individuals and smaller operations may have used an arastra for grinding the metal ore. The arastra is a primitive mill introduced to the New World by the Spanish around the year 1500. It consists of one or two flat-bottom drag stones that are placed in a circular pit which is covered with smaller flat stones. 
The drag stone is connected to a center post by a long arm, which is powered by a horse, a man, or a mule. The gold-bearing ore is placed in the pit, and the drag stone slowly grinds it between itself and the paving stones. Both the stamp mill technique and its more rudimentary cousin, the arastra, needed the same final stage to pull the gold from the ore. Once again, quicksilver was used to bond with the gold and leave the unwanted quartz behind. While this technique was effective and miners attempted to collect as much of the quicksilver for reuse as possible, much of it was lost and caused damage to the surrounding environment. Mercury deposits can still be found at the bottom of the San Francisco Bay to this very day. Because of man's great haste to become rich from mining gold, much of the land was torn apart with little to no forethought as to the long-ranging consequences of these actions. The gold rush not only helped shape California into the state that it soon became, but it fundamentally altered the size and scope of cities such as San Francisco. In some cases, it grew too fast and in careless directions. The miners and their machines forever altered the surrounding landscapes and environment. The resourcefulness of man has often been able to move mountains, but man's greed often overlooks how to replace and repair them. Too often, once the gold is gone, we leave only wreckage behind. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.